Uh, if you want to kind of stick your finger in Matthew 4, we'll be there a little bit uh, in a few minutes, but uh, we're going to be in Mark 1. Sean really enjoyed last week. How many of you enjoyed Sean last week? Is Sharon last week? Good, 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 good. Um, oh, I didn't switch it. There we go. Um, he really enjoyed it. He, he, like I said, he was one of the people who told me, you have the sweetest gig in the covenant right now. He goes, this is, this is, a, this is a great place to be. And uh, Sean gave us that bird's eye view of what we'll be looking at, uh, this living the Jesus-shaped life. And so uh, this week, we're going to talk about identity, and then we'll cover listening to the Holy Spirit next week. After that, we'll look at the invitation and challenge of discipleship. And then finally, we'll look at naturally supernatural, living that life that depends on the Holy Spirit to move and to act in the midst of our lives. And so uh, this morning, we already read from Mark 1, but what I'd like to do is pray uh, before we get going. And so uh, sometimes I like to do what I call positional prayers. I like to kind of get in a position to remind me of things. So, so this, what we're going to do this morning is you take your right hand like you're doing the Pledge of Allegiance. You just stick it on your heart and your left hand you stick on your head. And what we're going to do is we're going to pray that the Holy Spirit sinks his word deep into our hearts and our head. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word, and we pray this morning that through the power of your Holy Spirit, as we hear your words, as we know your words, may they sink into our hearts so that we can live your word. May we be molded more and more into the image of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. <laughs> All right, somebody's going to have to explain that to me sometime. But anyway, uh, when I was in fifth grade, uh, I had a friend named Darren Polson. Darren Polson. Darren and I uh, would hang out in, in, in school, and, and uh, we had a great time. We, would, we, would, uh, uh, we were kind of the terrors of the campus, and we'd, r we'd run around and we'd do our thing. Uh, but Darren and I had a dream that we were going to start a band. And so in fifth grade, it was going to be a rocking band in fifth grade. You know it. And so we were going to start a band, and so we had a, we had a classmate who played the drums, and we recruited him to be a part of this, and then we had another classmate uh, who was learning the stand-up bass, but we said, hey, you could play the electric bass if you could play the stand-up bass. So, so we recruited him, and then Darren and I were going to play guitar. Darren was going to be the lead guitarist, and I was going to be the rhythm guitarist. Okay, and so we had a pretty killer band in fifth grade. And so, uh, but again, this band was all in our minds. We talked about it a lot and we walked around about being in the band a lot. And so we would walk around and we would have, you know, like a, a guitar player magazine in our back pockets and we would stop at lunch and read this and we'd have different picks and we'd, we'd be playing with that and we'd talk about, you know, playing what we wanted to play and what were our favorite albums and what were our favorite songs and, and we'd get on the phone and back then you had this landline, right? Uh, you didn't have the, the, the cell phone. I think you have more landlines up here because cell service is just non-existent in part of this town. Uh, but but uh, and so you'd have that landline and you would be on the phone and you'd be in your room, but the phone, the base of the phone would be in the common area of your house. So you had that big, long cable coming all the way back into your room. A, a lot of you my age are, yeah, of course you did. Of course, pastor, I know exactly what you're talking about. And young people are like, what is he talking about? But we had it all, and, and we, we, I'd hear him play, and every time, man, my guitar wouldn't be working. But to be honest, here's the reality. I didn't know how to play the guitar. I did not know how to play the guitar. In fact, I didn't even own one. I didn't even own one. But everybody in school thought I was this great guitarist because... Uh, what I would do is actually go to my neighbor down the street and we had these cassette boxes that were rectangular and I'd record him playing his guitar and then I'd play that over the phone to Darren going, yeah, I could play. And I'd play this and I'd keep doing that and, and we'd talk and we had all this and then one day we had this opportunity in class. Yeah, you know where this is going. Yeah, to come to school 
and actually demonstrate and, and show our class our talents. We had this kind of talent day this week in which it was going. We kept postponing it. I kept postponing. I said, oh, my guitar, I, I broke a string. And Darren would give me strings. And I'd be like, oh, thank you. Now, now I had strings, but not a guitar. And so I'd, I'd go home and I'd take these and I'd put them on. And I had this whole thing going. And finally, on Friday, I showed up without a guitar. And Darren had his. He was ready to play. And he's like, oh, man. And I go, yeah, I went out. I don't know what's going on. I did everything. He goes, that's fine. And so he got up, and he played a little riff for the class. And he said, yeah, and now Bud's going to play. And so there I am in class. You know, this is, this is one of those stories. That's how I ended up standing in front of my fifth grade class with a guitar around my neck and not knowing how to play the guitar. And I'm standing there, and I'm trying to figure this out because I'm thinking, how hard can it be? Darren can play, you know? But, and, it, and I was just exposed. I was living something that I wasn't. In fact, I was telling people that I was something that I wasn't. And I think we go through life and we do that a lot more than we like to admit. I think a lot more than we like to admit, we tell people we have it all together when we don't. A lot more than we like to admit, we, we just don't know what we're doing. A lot more than we like to admit, we like to th show people that we're in control when we're not. I also remember when I was uh, graduating uh, my different degrees. So before I got, I got a college degree and then seminary degree, I remember waking up in the middle of the night because I would have nightmares that I was being called back to junior high because I didn't graduate from junior high. And I was faking my whole, did any of you ever have that study, that nightmare when you were getting your degrees? Oh my goodness, it was terrible. It was like it was yesterday. But I think in the midst of life, we go through our lives and sometimes we just can't connect who we are with the way we live. We have a problem doing that. And we're talking about living the Jesus-shaped life and there's something about Jesus that absolutely is congruous. It is absolutely parallel. It is absolutely on track with who Jesus is from the beginning of the Gospels to the end of the Gospels. Jesus had this fixation, not just on what he was about to do, not just on what he was called to do, not just on what was the right thing to do, but he knew who he was, or he knows who he is. If you, if you look up on the screen, we have the, we have the verse that was just read. And uh, up there in the yellow, there's that part where, where this voice comes down from heaven. You are my son, whom I love, with whom, with, with you, I am well pleased. There's three things that this voice that we understand to be, it, this is the heavenly father declaring about Jesus. There are three things that this voice says about Jesus. First of all, it says, this is my son. This is my son. This is my son. The second thing that it says is, whom I love. I love this man. I love this person who's just been baptized in front of you all. I love him. And the third thing it says, notice Jesus hasn't had, he hasn't started his ministry yet. He hasn't gone out and healed. He hasn't done any of that yet. But the voice from heaven, the heavenly father from heaven says, with whom I am well pleased. Let, let, can we go back to the, ver, the verse? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just reviewing this. So let's, yeah, there we go. Um, with whom I am well pleased. So those three things are said about Jesus. You have this, you're my son, you're loved, and I'm pleased in you. I delight in you. And this is even before Jesus starts his public ministry. 
You know, there's parallels to Jesus' identity and our own identity. I believe if we want to live a Jesus-shaped life, if we want to live our lives shaped the same way that Jesus lived his life, we need to understand who we are. We need to understand who we are in Christ. We need to understand who we are in God. We need to understand this. In fact, uh, for... Uh, uh, to help you do that during the week. And if you, if you ever start uh, uh, wondering about that, we have on the back table there, uh, we have these, they're kind of big bookmarks, but they're bookmarks. And they talk about all these things that the Bible says you are in God's eyes. All of these things. This isn't even everything, okay? This isn't even everything. These are just some of the things. Okay, all the things that God says you are. But we're going to cover some of that right now. So the, the, go ahead to the first slide. The, the, this next one, it says that at his baptism, God calls Jesus his son. And we are called, in Scripture, it says we are called children of God. You can look up these verses, John 1, 1, 12. These are all on the bookmark, so you can look them up. Uh, we are all called sons of God, and we are all called heirs with Christ. I want to point this out with sons of God, okay? Whether you are male or female in Scripture, okay, you are considered, according to Romans, having sonship in God. What I mean by this and what the, what the New Testament means by this is the firstborn son had a very special place in the household, right? You can nod. It's okay. Had a very special place. Uh, today, we tend to, when, uh, as parents or whatever, we tend to send our inheritance and split it evenly and try to be fair and all that. In the first century, that wasn't the way it was. The firstborn son got the inheritance. There would be some that would be left to the other children, but the firstborn son got the inheritance. They were considered the adult steward manager of the next inheritor of the, of the household. And since God's still alive, the, that firstborn son also is the steward while they're alive, while their parent is alive. They're the one who, who oversees the house, who oversees the, the father's business. In Romans it says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. Sonship. All children are this sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, we are also heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we might also share in his glory. Paul writes that in Romans chapter 8. The incredible thing about this is as a son, as an heir, you are provided for. Right? That's what an inheritance is. It provides for you. When we view ourselves as the sons or as the children and Jesus as the son of God, it's that voice, it says, it's, what God is saying is, I provide for you. I give to you. I give to you in abundance. I provide for you all that you need and even more than what you need, all that your heart desires. I provide for you. I give you this vast inheritance. That's what it's saying. So as we go about as believers, as disciples, we have this incredible inheritance that we live out. But not only that, it also says in there that Jesus is told, with you I am well pleased. We are called, and the next slide says, we are called fearfully and wonderfully made. Right? Right? Pleased. We're called delighted in, in Scripture. And finally, Paul writes to the church in Ephesus that they are God's masterpiece. Let 
but because of his, uh, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God is well pleased in us. He finds pleasure in us. He finds joy in us. One of the prayers that, that we gather for prayer every, every Sunday morning uh, before we start the worship service, and one of the prayers that I always pray is just to remind myself, it's not about the performance. It's not about how I do. It's not about the songs and are we on key and do all the slides go or did Pastor Bud tell us points in order because as you can tell, I already skipped a point and I'm gonna have to go back. It's not about any of that. It's about the fact that I gather and God finds joy in my presence in his place. I mean, think about that. Just the fact that you came this morning, God finds joy. He finds joy. He goes, yeah, I, I love this. I love my family getting together. The older I get, the more joy I find in that statement because, you know, my kids now live up in Seattle. I don't get to see them that much. But when we're all in the same house, there's a certain amount of joy and, and, and just completeness of being there. And I got my kids here. I got everything going. This is awesome. And that's how God feels when we gather in his presence. That's what happens. Let's go back to the last slide. Sorry about that. Um, Jesus is told whom I love. We are called beloved by God. We are called that we are, we are told that we are cared for by God. And we are also called chosen, holy, and beloved. Paul echoes th this in, in um, Ephesians, this whole idea to sonship. It says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So he's provided for us, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be homely and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise and of his glorious grace, which he's freely given us in the one we love. We oftentimes get get into these battles over words in the New Testament, right? I mean, sometimes we get into a battle of predestination or free will. Am I chosen or is it foreknowledge? We get into all these battles. But what I want to say is, is those discussions are important and they feed our mind and they deepen our understanding of God and of Scripture and all that. But really, just as we prayed, we need to connect our heart to these words too. We need to connect our heart to these words. I'll never forget a story that I was told by a by a seminary professor. He was talking about his daughter went to her first junior high dance. And she went to a dance and she came to the parents and, and before she went to the dance, she asked her parents if she could go to the dance and he was fine with her going to the dance and he'd drop her off. And so the whole two weeks before the dance, she was talking about what she would wear and where would she go and what kind of music she wanted to have. And a lot of what she would talk about, he'd hear her talking about on the phone is who she wanted to dance with. Who she wanted to dance. Who did she want to have choose her to dance? And so the whole two weeks go up, and then it gets to be that day, and she gets all dressed up, and it's, and it's the afternoon. It's a junior high dance. It's not like it's the evening. It's the afternoon. He gets her in the car. He drives her to the school. He drops her off. She walks up the steps, goes into the school, heads into the cafeteria or the gym where they're going to do the dance. And then he goes over to the coffee shop, and he's sitting at the coffee shop for a couple hours and then he came back after two hours and picks her up and she comes, you know, she's up on the top talking with all her friends and he comes and she comes skipping down the, uh, so excited and comes down the stairs and sits in the car and as they're heading home, the couple of miles to home, they get in the car and he starts asking her questions, how to go? And she's telling him about the music and the decorations and all her friends that were there and how much fun it was and everything that happened and, and, and exactly what, you know, when it happened and everything else. And, and as he's just about to pull up on the street that, that they live on and start driving up the hill a little bit, he asks her the question. So... Who asked you to dance? And he said at that moment, she looked down at her feet. She said, 
said, nobody. Nobody. Now it was a junior high dance, and all of us who've been to junior high dances know that's how it goes. But for her, a junior high girl, that nobody chose her to dance, asked her to dance. It was the one down part of the evening or of the afternoon. And he said at that moment as he was turning up the road and driving up the hill, he was thinking, I would have paid any junior high boy 20 bucks to ask my daughter to dance. I'd have done anything to make sure she knew she was chosen. I want to tell you right now, one of the things that excites me as a preacher is I would do anything to tell you that you're chosen. Anything. Anything short of sin, I would tell you, I would do anything to help you realize you were chosen by the creator of the universe to spend eternity with him. I would do anything. I would, I would talk. I would, I, you know, I've had pies thrown in my face. I've had my head shaved. I've had anything done just to get people to hear that they've been chosen by God. I want you to know you have been chosen by God. That's how much he loves you. Now, I can only spend about two, three days with my family, at most my parents and my brothers and sisters. I go and visit them in Alabama, and I tell my wife, we, we, we plan this out. We go, okay, we're, we can only do two, three days. I tell them, let's go four days this time. She goes, you sure? You sure? She doesn't call me pastor. She has other names for me when I come up with this stuff. She goes, you sure? And I get there, and sure enough, two, two and a half days is about all I could take. And God goes, I want to spend eternity with you. And he delights that whole time. That's who you are. You are God's child whom he loves and in whom he is well pleased. Just as in Jesus is, we are also. We have that identity. That's who we are in Christ. Isn't that beautiful? But you know, and so... I want to show, uh, Sean talked about this a little bit here with the, with the system here. Do we have the, the next? Here we go. We have, he talked about this as the relationship lens or covenant. And so the father, uh, and we have father, identity, and obedience. Let's go to the next slide real quick. This is the direction things travel. The father gives us our identity. He bestows upon us our identity. But, and then our identity drives our obedience. Who we are in Christ drives how we follow Jesus. You got that? You got that? Okay. Do you have that? Okay. Thank you. Because what I want to say here is most of us, a lot of the times, don't live that way. We believe our obedience sets up our identity, which places us where God will then love us. Or finally find joy in us. We go backwards in this. But that isn't how Scripture says this goes. Scripture says, no, you are children of God in Christ Jesus. You are well loved. And you have already pleased Him. Isn't that incredibly liberating? Isn't that incredibly freeing? Doesn't that make obedience much easier? Because we just live out of who we already understand that we are. But this gets attacked. This, the idea of identity gets attacked, and it got attacked in the first temptations of Jesus. When Jesus went into the wilderness, and we don't have the details of that in Mark, but we do have it in, in uh, Matthew and Luke. Uh, and so what I want to say is that uh, he gets into the wilderness, and the first thing that happens is Jesus led into the wilderness, and the tempter comes to him, or Satan comes to him and says, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Here's what he's doing. If you're the Son of God, why hasn't your Father provided you what you need? That's the question. Why hasn't your father provided what you need? You're hungry. 
Where's your father? He's supposed to be providing for you. He's supposed to be giving to you. And Jesus brilliantly answers, with man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And what Jesus is saying is that my heavenly father has provided for me, will provide, it for, provide for me, and continues to provide for me today. That's what he's saying. He's saying, my appetite for something else may be wrong or misguided. And one of the temptations we have is our appetite. Sometimes we yearn or lust or hunger or thirst for something other than what our Father provides for us. Or we want to get it done ourselves. And so we have on, on the next slide, we have a, uh, something is that if your heavenly Father won't feed your appetite, it's time to hunger for something greater. Because it's an identity issue. If you feel you have to get it done yourself without depending on God, if you feel like God's not providing for you what you need, that's an identity issue because you are a beloved child of God. You are one who inherits from God. Paul writes in Ephesians, he says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work with him within us. To him be glory in church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. He's able to give us more than we ask or imagine. Why do we stay with just what we want? Why do we stay with just what we want? Our Heavenly Father provides us everything we need. We're inheritors. We're inheritors of the kingdom. It goes on and it says, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest place of the temple. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. He will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift you up in their hands that they will not strike your foot against a stone. Here's where he's challenging. He's challenging Jesus. Hey, does God really love you? Does your father really love you? Just jump. If he loves you, he'll save you. Just jump. If he loves you, he'll, he'll, he'll save you. He'll bring you. He'll keep you protected. But as the next slide shows, Jesus answers. He says, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus didn't need any more applause. He didn't need any more proof. He didn't need any more. He knew that God loved him. That was all the applause he needed. That was all the confirmation he needed was that the promise of his father saying, I love you. How many times do we go through life and we want the applause of somebody else? We want somebody else to go, oh, we love you. Oh, how great you are. I think, it, I think it's particularly dangerous in people who, 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 who like preach, stand up front, or musicians, artists, maybe people who are in the trades. We like to be admired for what we can do. We like to be loved for what we produce. And we like that. And if we don't hear the applause, we start to think we're not loved. But God loves us. And we need to depend on that love. That's the only applause I need. Can you say that? That's the only applause I need. What is the only applause I need? God's love. God's love is the only applause I need just changes your whole perspective in how you go about life. And then finally, the final part in here is that, uh, again, the devil takes him to a very high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, all this I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. Now, this one always confused me when I was young. I was like, well, Jesus already has it all. He has it all. He's the son of God. He already has it all. 
But really what this temptation is about is, is it's about, is Jesus going to fulfill God's will or is he going to take a shortcut? Is he going to take a shortcut? Because we see in the book of Revelation, Jesus is already sitting at the right hand of the Father. We already see that Jesus is sitting on the throne. We already see all this. So you're like, well, okay. But Satan is going to take a shortcut here. Take the easy way. The last point I want to make here is that there are no shortcuts on the road to God's will. There are no shortcuts on the road to God's will. Is that if we're going to follow God, if we're going to follow Jesus, if we're going to follow the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit, we need to understand there are no shortcuts on that road. It's a tenuous and continual ride. This is a cool picture because it's, uh, it's actually a road I've been on. It's, uh, it's, in, it's in Kashmir, uh, northern India, uh, and it's the road from Srinagar to Leh, uh, Ladakh. And so it's, it's, it's a road. How many of you have ever seen Ice Road Truckers? Or, yeah, this is on that road. This is on that show. And so it is such a narrow and perilous road that it only goes north in the morning and south in the, in the afternoon. That's how they run. So from midnight to noon, you can run north on it. And from noon to midnight, you run south on it. <laughs> it's crazy, huh? That was a fun day. But, uh, but, uh, but it just reminded me, because I remember sitting there, and Pastor Santosh, who's, who's from the area, would stop occasionally at the edge and have us look down, and you'd be, you know, and it just, it would go forever, you know? And he says, see that road? That's the road we have to take. That's the road we have to take. And we'd always tease him, Santosh, take the shortcut. And you always go, brother, there are no shortcuts. Brother, there are no shortcuts. There are no shortcuts on the road to God's will. Will we embrace, the question for us as disciples is, are we going to embrace the identity that God proclaims for us in Scripture, or are we going to fashion our own identity? Are we going to create for ourselves this new identity, this new person, this, this other thing that at some point in time will be, either be exposed or to crumble or to leave us lacking? Or will we be a people who follow the identity we have in Christ? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for how you bring us together. And Father, we pray that we may be a people who unashamedly pursue what you have for us, who unashamedly pursue your identity and your will and your purpose in our lives. Father, may we understand that we inherit so much in your Son. Father, may we embrace that love that you proclaim for us. May your love be deafening to our ears so that even when there is other applause, we don't hear it. And Father, may we be a people who pursue your will and your glory with all our lives, knowing that we are your masterpiece. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.